Hello, today our guest is Linda Collette of the Collette Law Firm. Uh, she's a business transaction attorney here in Atlanta and today she's going to talk to us a little bit about her story and a little bit about how uh, small business owners strategically really need to talk to an attorney to save themselves from trouble down the road. What are some three key areas they can do that with? Linda, thank you so much for being our guest today. Thank you for having me, Cordelia. I'm delighted to be here. Can you tell us a little bit about your own sort of business background and how you became a business attorney? Absolutely. So I'm actually a second career attorney, uh, which means that I had a career in commercial insurance for about 17 years and then decided I wanted to go to law school. So I graduated law school in 2005 at the age of 45, <laughs> so it was a big transition. Um, and coming out of law school, the one thing that I knew that I didn't want to do is I didn't want to be a litigator. So I did not want to argue as a way of life, which is really what it boils down to in litigation. That makes sense, yeah. yeah. So I was really focusing on transactional type work. and. Um, was f originally focusing on estate planning, which I do do a little bit of, but when I got into it and worked for a firm that was also doing business transaction work, I realized that that's really uh, was much more interesting to me and a better fit for uh, my background and that type of thing. So I'm a business transaction attorney, which basically means that I help businesses avoid the stress and expense of legal problems, of legal hassles, of disputes, misunderstandings, litigation, uh, so that they can focus their resources, their time, their energy into growing their business rather than dealing with hassles. So what I'd love for you to, to share with us is some of your top three um, mistakes you would say that small business owners make in terms of not getting legal documents? That's a hard question to answer because it really depends upon the business. Um, so one document that I see a lot of business owners not get, which is really, really important, and it's that scenario that you're talking about. It's really important um, and people don't realize it until something happens and then it's too late. And that has to do with people who are going into business with a partner. Yes, and this can be if you're partnered with just a regular person or a spouse even, because I think even spouses don't necessarily, they're like, oh, well, we're married, that's our agreement, and you're you say no. You're absolutely right. And there are, you know, and, and one of the things that a good partnership agreement will deal with is what happens if there's a divorce, mm -hmm. whether, you know, the partners are married or they're married just other people. Because what I look at the, a lot of the terms in the partnership agreement, it all boils down to protecting each owner's right to be in business with the person that they choose to be in with. So we're talking about things related to you know, buying and selling the ownership interests in the company. So what happens if somebody dies? What happens to their ownership interest? And where is the liquidity from that ownership interest for the family of the deceased partner? Mm -hmm. So really need to address those things before it's too late. Because even if you're young, we all know that accidents still happen. Right. So, and so death and divorce, you got to... Death and divorce. And um, disability, too. Disability. The Ds. Absolutely. The Ds. You got to handle the Ds. <laughs> disability. The other thing is what happens if your partner goes through a personal bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. Because then the ownership interest is now at the you know, under the control of the bankruptcy trustee. So now the person, the partner who's not in bankruptcy is in business with a trustee who may or may not know anything about how to run the business. Um, you know, another situation is what happens if a partner wants to resign? Like they no longer are interested in being involved in this business. And the business, the company is relying upon their expertise to be successful. So it doesn't mean that the person has to be locked in forever, but if they want to leave and go do something else, what might make sense is that they have to sell their ownership interest back to the company or to the other owner so that they're not just 
sitting back, not doing anything, and profiting from all of the hard work of the remaining partner who's not only going to have to continue doing what they were doing, but step up and cover what the other, you know, what the person who wanted to leave uh, was doing. So it's all about making sure that the company survives and protecting each owner's right to be in business with who they choose to be in business with. So I think that's a really great point, and um, having recently done one of these contracts myself, there were definitely a lot of dimensions that I hadn't necessarily thought about, but it, it's good to work those things out when everybody's getting along. Absolutely. And you can talk about, you know, of course I'm never going to get divorced, but just in case, you know, or whatever, because I have seen businesses be torn apart by divorce, because then... You know, two partners who think they're in partnership with each other, it turns out you have this other spouse that has a legal right to half of that person's share. Exactly. So what are some other kind of like worst case scenarios that you've seen where people didn't have agreements and they came to you and it was really too late? Well, so my whole focus of my practice is helping people avoid that situation. Okay. <laughs> Gotcha. So, so they yeah. go to a different attorney at that exactly. point. Exactly. <laughs> then at that point, they'd have to work with a litigator. A litigator. And that gets, okay. you know, very expensive besides um, uh, just the, the stress, the loss of sleep, the guilt that they might feel. Like, how did I get myself into this, you know, situation? I Like, I really should have known better. Why didn't I know better? All of these things are the things that I'm trying to avoid, help right. people avoid. And one of the things I love about the agreement, too, that you can set up is you can kind of set up expectations for what each partner is supposed to be doing. Yes. And so you can say, what is non-participation? Let's quantify that. Is non-participation because you're sick for a week? No. Right. No, exactly. But is non-participation meaning you haven't responded to emails for six months or whatever it is? You can actually set that in the contract, and I think that's a great protection to have in place. And on top of that, even though this wouldn't necessarily be in the agreement, I really recommend that partners come up with job descriptions for themselves and for each other so that there is clear understanding about what it is that each person is going to be doing um, in exchange for their ownership interest. Or, you know, you can even set it, you know, depending upon the tax setup of your of your company, and I'm not going to go into that, right. but, you know, you can set up salaries and that type of thing. And so what is it that they are um, going to be expected to do to earn that salary? Um, and then that's where it comes into if they are failing to fulfill their obligations, that can trigger their requirement to sell the company or yeah. their sell their ownership interest. And I'm going to say, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that, and see if you agree with me. I think for couples and family members who are in business together, it's almost more important that they have these kind of agreements in place because it's so easy to have these sort of unspoken rules in families that are, um, and then you're just stuck. Oh. You're stuck for, you know, it's they're your family member. Well, and also just think how uncomfortable it is around the dinner table. Right. Or at family gatherings or whatever. You know, it's sort of like you can't go to business, excuse me, you can't go to work and get away with going on in the family, and you can't go home and get away with what's going on, right. at, get away from what's going on at work. So. so I think one more important thing about this that I want to highlight is that these kind of agreements aren't just about divorce and death but non-participation, and there's a lot of things that are kind of hashed out when you even create the agreement yes. that can really help you run your business yeah. better. So, a couple, you know, another uh, thing that needs to be addressed, especially if it's 50-50 owners, is what happens if there's a deadlock. Mm, yes. Because nobody has that majority vote. So how are you going to get past a deadlock? Because a deadlock could completely tank the company if you can't move forward and grow. And then that also creates just a lot of um, animosity um, and problems between the owners. Okay, great. So agree number one is, it's called the buy-sell agreement. Is that what it's called? Well, the, those are terms, oh, kind terms. of buy-sell okay. provisions. Uh, that would be some of the things that you would include in a partnership agreement. A partnership agreement, okay. And, and even partnership agreement is a broad term. 
because the form that it would take is not necessarily a document called a partnership agreement. You know, if you're an LLC, you would put it into the operating agreement. If you're some kind of a corporate entity, you would do like a shareholders agreement. So Okay. So whatever the agreement's called, the gist is you got to work all this stuff out. Exactly. Okay. Yes. Um, and this is one thing, this is what a, a business transaction attorney does this. This is what they do all the time. So that's what you do and other people like you. Okay, so let's talk about the next kind of agreement that you see is missing for businesses. They tend to back burner when they shouldn't. Well, one of the things that I think might be of particular interest to your members and mm -hmm. your audience is going to be independent contractor agreements. Ah, yes, absolutely. And, um, and, and one of the mistakes that I see people make or business owners make is that they don't have their own customized template that's right for their business, that's been customized for them, that they can then use with all of their independent contractors. And the uh, and I have an interesting story related to this, actually. This wasn't a client, but this was a friend. And he had a company that he had hired an independent contractor. Uh, he was here in Georgia, and the independent contractor was in Pennsylvania. And the independent contractor provided the work that she was supposed to provide, and he said it was horrible, he couldn't use it. So he told her, I'm not going to pay you. And her response is, well, I'm going to sue you. Well, they didn't have anything in writing. And so here's the problem with that. First of all, if they'd had it in writing where there was some kind of a service standard that set it up that she had to meet certain standards of the work that she delivered to him, then he would have had terms for not paying her. But in Georgia, we have a law called quantum merit, which basically means that a service provider is entitled to be paid for the value of the service that they provided. And so he, he, here in Georgia, he wouldn't be able to get away with saying that I'm not going to pay you. And she's in Pennsylvania. He's here. We don't have a written agreement as to where are we going to file this suit. So she may file to try and sue him in Pennsylvania. And now he's having to hire an attorney in Pennsylvania. He's having to travel to Pennsylvania to deal with this matter, whereas these are some of the things that, if they'd had an agreement, could have been worked out in advance. Right. And I think that's something, if you have an agreement as a business owner and you're hiring a contractor, you say, this is what you're agreeing to. Exactly. And if you don't agree, then let's not work together. Yeah. So or you spending might that money in advance can... All it takes is one problem down the road and you way overspent whatever it costs you to come up with that contractor agreement. Yeah. And I love how you said a template. So you could go to an attorney and say, okay, look, this is the type of work I do with contractors. Can we come up with like kind of a form and then mm -hmm. I'll just be able to go in and change the name of the person and exactly. uh, maybe modify the, the terms a little depending on what the work is. So you're not having to pay each time you hire a contractor. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. And uh, it's the starting point. It doesn't mean that you still might not negotiate some points, mm -hmm. but you have it really clear. And just going through the process of coming up with this template forces you to think through all of the issues. And so you know now what your bottom line is. You know what you have to have. You know what you're not willing to negotiate, and you know what things that you're willing to negotiate. Okay. Um, the other thing that I think is important for people to know is that uh, you have to know your own state's contractor versus employee laws because you can't just hire anybody as a contractor because you feel like it. Like there's actually laws protecting, the laws are designed to protect people from like not getting paid benefits and things like that. So ha can you talk a little bit about that? I know it's different by state. Well, it's different by state, but it's also um, a federal issue. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, um, and thank you for bringing this up because this is a big issue that um, is getting more attention lately. So this is this is a scenario. People want to 
hire somebody and call them an independent contractor so they don't have to do withholding, you know, tax withholdings and, you know, pay them in benefits and all of this kind of stuff. And that's great. There are real realistic scenarios where that makes sense. But there is the IRS, there is the Department of Labor, and there is each state workers' compensation board that all take interest in whether this person is, is truly an independent contractor versus an employee. And take IRS. If they come in and they find out that they make their own evaluation and it's like 25 different things that they look at. Okay. One of those things is whether there's a written agreement. Mm. So it's, it's a good to have a written agreement that helps your case. It's like this balancing. There, it's no clear line between what's an employee versus what's an independent contractor. They look at all of these factors and they see, well, it balances more towards, yes, I think this is an independent contractor. And one of the things that they will look at that will favor that is if there's a written agreement. Okay. But that's only one. The real issues are, is this person marketing themselves so that they will have other clients as mm -hmm. well? Or are you their only client? Okay. Are they, um, do they have control over the means and the manner and the time in which they perform the services? Or are you really treating them like an employee and you tell them when to show up, you provide them the equipment to do whatever they need to do, you uh, tell them how to do the work as opposed to just looking at the results like you would if you hired a true vendor, so to speak, and said, okay, I want them to develop a website for me, and I'm going to just turn them loose. I'm going to give them the parameters that I want, and I'm only going to evaluate the end result. I'm not going to tell them how to do their job. So that's an independent contractor. Whereas if you're calling them an independent contractor, but you're telling them how to do the job, that's going to tip the scale more towards them being an employee. Okay. And if, if the IRS determines that they're an employee, you have to pay all that stuff. Exactly. And so, yes, and it's going back from whenever they started work with you, then it's the back taxes that you didn't withhold. There's interest. There's penalties. It gets very expensive. Okay. So a contractor agreement and understanding if somebody's an employee or a contractor are very important for business owners. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and then what about, what other kinds of documents can businesses, um, is it worth businesses having done by an attorney? Well, again, it's always going to depend upon the business. Um, client agreements, I draft a lot of client agreements. So this is where a business owner enters into an agreement with their customers and their clients. Um, so do a lot of those. Um, independent contractor agreements, any kind of a vendor agreement, like mm -hmm. somebody is providing a, you know, a service to you, employment agreements, if you truly do have employees, some of the critical things to address there would be confidentiality, non-compete, non-solicitation, so that they can't go away and take your customers with them right. or your other employees, those types of things. Also, things related to intellectual property if they are developing intellectual property. So intellectual property is this broad term that has to do with, you know, the, the, um, the, the uh, things like copyrights, patents, ideas, all of those types of things. Um, so you want to make sure that the company owns that intellectual property that may have been developed by an employee. Okay. Because that goes to the value of the company. So that's an asset of the company. And if you go to sell the company or something like that, or even if you're going to be like a um, go and get funding, um, they're going to look at that relative to the value of the company. Do you have clear title to all of this intellectual property? Okay. So sometimes I think when you're small and starting out, none of this stuff seems important. But then as you grow, you get busy and that's when this stuff really becomes important. When you're starting to grow and add team members, however you do it, can perhaps get funding, 
things like that. And so taking the time up front to do this along the way is really important. And I, I would just say that it's important from day one because you never know when the problem is going to occur. Right. And, you know, some examples, a um, couple of things. I had a client who was renting equipment. That was just kind of a sideline. That wasn't really what his business was, but he, and it was this very specialized environmental equipment. And he went out and found an agreement online that he was okay. using for renting out this equipment and had in there the requirement that the person who rented it, if they flew with it, that they didn't check it as baggage and that also that they had to get insurance on it. Well, of course, somebody rents it, checks it as baggage, and it gets lost. And this is a $15,000 piece of equipment. And now we go to the rental agreement, and of course, the person who rented it also didn't get insurance. And there was no teeth in this agreement as far as the fact that, okay, if you don't insure it and you lose it, you have to pay $15,000. There wasn't anything in there like that. Oh. So the, the, you know, my client who came to me after the fact, um, he lost this $15,000 worth of equipment. And so he then came to me to revise it so it doesn't happen again. Right. <laughs> but there's a real problem with There's more than once I will sh say that I have been, you know, hired to uh, revise, correct an agreement that somebody came up with on their own and they didn't know what they were doing and they didn't understand what was missing um, or that they've downloaded from places like LegalZoom. Okay. So that would be, it seems like that might be a way, if you're trying to save money a little bit, you could say, here's an agreement, let's modify it versus let's write one from scratch, or do you think it really doesn't matter in terms of savings? It, it can. It all depends upon how good the first document is. Right. <laughs> so that makes sense. How right. close is it, right? My kid did this with crayon, yeah. Linda. <laughs> Fix it. Exactly. Um, so... So, uh, so for so in e-commerce, um, one of the struggles we're having now is we, uh, many of us as retailers are trying to you know work with wholesalers, mm -hmm. and uh, market their products and sell their products on marketplaces like Amazon, mm -hmm. um, and we have companies that say, oh yes, you're our number one seller. We're gonna roll the red carpet out. We're not selling to anyone else, and then. They they don't follow that at all. <laughs> they change their mind later. Um, so what can we? I guess a, a wholesale agreement between you know my company and whatever Nike. I'm going to say as an example, not Nike, but mm -hmm. some other big company that I'm wholesaling from. Is that something that you think companies are likely to sign? Is that something where we can ha we can come to an attorney and, and have a document cr drafted like that? Yes. And I would encourage it. Um, lots of times what I see when you're dealing with the large, you know, the big corporate entities, they've already got their own agreement okay. that they want you to sign. And the issue there and the kind of the mistake that I see people make is that they want the business so badly, you know, they think, oh, it's Nike or, you know, oh, so I really want that business. It's going to be great. And they don't understand what it is that they're signing. Mm. So they haven't had that agreement reviewed by an attorney. And then it's not so important that the attorney reviews and understands it. What's really important is that the attorney then talks with you, talks you through that agreement so that you understand what the risks are, what you're really agreeing to, and then you can decide, I mean, the attorney can help you decide whether this is something that it's a risk you want to take or it's something that you may want to go back and negotiate. And, you know, so I've had some clients and I've, my clients have been small companies and we've been negotiating against multi-billion dollar companies and we are able to negotiate some things because there are some terms in those agreements that the, the, multi-billion dollar company wants that could literally bankrupt my client. Right. And so I've had success in being able to go back to them and explaining to them why we really can't agree to this and so can you work with us on this and they will. 
Okay. Um, and and so to your you know to your point, that exclusivity you know if they're looking for exclusivity, you want to have that in writing. Mm-hmm. You know that's all got to be spelled out because that's the only way you're going to be able to enforce that. Okay. So um, so that that kind of brings to another point you and I had covered earlier, which is um, having an attorney sort of on call. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so developing a relationship with an yes. attorney mm-hmm. um, so that when you get these documents, you are having them reviewed. Exactly. And, and you don't have to then go find somebody at that point. Right. And you're, you're dealing with somebody who knows your business. So you can, it's much, you know, more cost effective because it's quicker because we're not having to lay the foundation. And also, um, one of the things that I, I've been learning as I've been working with you is having, understanding a legal document sort of in a, a distant way is different than having an attorney explain to you exactly how this is going to impact you and sort of, it's like you're on my corner. Mm-hmm. You're not really just, an, you're not just some attorney saying, well, this is what this means. Yes. You're like, well, this is not gonna be good for you. Yes. This is what you should, you know. Mm-hmm. And so um, even if, you know, like you're working with somebody else who is an attorney that's a great attorney, if they're paying for that attorney's time, that attorney's job is to be in their corner. And so having one in your corner who's specifically protecting your interests is, I think, is a really good thing to do. I would agree. And I will say that without question, every time a client has come to me with an agreement they've been asked to sign and asked me to review it, and then we talk about it. So I, first of all, I recommend you pay for that extra hour or you know, right. 30 minutes to 60 Don't minutes or whatever yep. <laughs> to talk with, have the attorney talk through the agreement with you. There has never been an agreement where I haven't found something that the client said, oh, I didn't realize that was in there and I didn't understand the consequence of that. And so that, you know, they now... They may then decide that they're willing to take that risk, and they may not go back and, you know, they may still sign the agreement, but there was, I mean, without fail, there's always been something that they didn't understand about that agreement. Okay, great. Um, So thank you so much for being our guest today. Um, Linda is a, a Georgia attorney. Yes. All right, thank you again today for being our guest today, Linda. Thank you for having me. I've tried to be